بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم عزیزان من آپ کو آپ کے بھائی عادل راجا کا سلام پہنچے آج ایک خصوصی مہمان کے ساتھ میں آپ کے پاس حاضر ہوں اس وقت سوشل میڈیا کے اوپر ویوز ہیں سمی حامد کی اور سمی حامدی جو ہیں وہ ہمارے دوست ہیں آج ہم نے ان سے درخواست کی کوئی یہاں پہ آئیں ٹوڈے ویو گوٹ اسپیشل گیسٹ وی یو مسٹر سمی حامدی ویلکم ٹو دا شو السلام علیکم سمی حامدی ہاؤ ویو وعلیکم السلام ورحمۃ اللہ عادہ تھینک یو فار ہیونگ ایوریتھنگ گڈ ہاؤ یو Uh, alhamdulillah i'm fine we are in the same city as and uh, we are we are both uh, looking at the gray weather but uh, uh, that's not the topic today today we are going to discuss how important is imran khan for the muslim ummah and how important it is to carve a separate identity for the muslim ummah from what it is and why it is important and why the issue of palestine and kashmir is being brushed under the carpet i mean these are the taboo topics you cannot really talk about openly but today we are going to talk on these topics for sure but before that uh, would you please introduce uh, i mean you are a very well known personality but would you please introduce yourself to the pakistani audience Thank you very much Adil. Uh, my main job is, is is a consultant so I advise on on foreign policy on on political environments and the like for both commercial entities for 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 governments for foreign ministries or the like explaining to them in my opinion what's happening and how they can navigate some of those difficult political environments. So my background is politics but mainly from uh, advising people how to navigate them so they don't get burnt in those political environments. as opposed to uh, uh, getting themselves caught up in it but i but i spent many years and, and and i still write articles as as a journalist covering the issues related to the middle east and beyond mainly the the, the muslim world in particular primarily because i think that everybody is interested in the muslim world everybody is competing there whether it's the us russia china everybody is competing with the muslim world and i think that there is benefit in trying to get a new generation of muslims who are more interested in their region so that they might be able to tap into that power to become one of the major players as opposed to being the ones who are played sami why is it important for the muslim world to become uh, um, uh, become a player at the international stage and carve a different identity from what it is right now what's problem with the identity we've got right now i think the reality is that when we th- there are two levels of the identity that the muslim world tries to enjoy there's one in which it's all talk and one that is more substantive the all talk is the one about the idea that we are one umma which even if it is true does not necessarily translate into something that is tangible the reality is that if we look at for example the iraq war the american planes took off from muslim countries to bomb iraq if we look at libya the planes took off from muslim countries to bomb libya we always have this idea that we are one umma but when we look at a lot of the disasters that take place Uh, in the region it's often muslim countries who are involved in plotting against the other even if we look at pakistan for example for a pakistani audience to uh, to understand the uae and saudi arabia for example their ties with india today are becoming much closer than they are with pakistan and this time when the saudi crown prince mohammed bin salman went to india usually the saudis do a symbolic visit to pakistan or give some like to sort of highlight that we're still with pakistan this time the saudi crown prince didn't even bother he just went straight to india went and attended the G20 summit with India and they signed this new Middle East corridor of which Pakistan is not even included as part of this corridor either in which India and Israel are set to benefit and this is why I think identity is important because it is the identity that governs the priorities in foreign policy take for example why Saudi Arabia has changed in recent times Saudi Arabia vision 2030 de-islamization of Saudi Arabia de-islamization of the foreign policy which result in this capacity for new alliances with non-muslim countries at the expense of muslim countries whereas for example you compare it to the likes of turkey i'm not saying turkey is perfect but you compare it for example with erdogan who has been insisting on a more muslim orientated foreign policy even if it is a a a, a title but you see it in mali you see it in senegal you see it in these central asian muslim countries where erdogan has really actively pushed in an unprecedented way for closer ties that we saw in Azerbaijan recently with Nagorno Karabakh Turkey has secured a win against Russia Russia was used to dominate that area Turkey has empowered Azerbaijan to retake Nagorno Karabakh from the Armenians that was supported by the US France and Russia the idea being that on the one hand you have a foreign policy where Turkey is now moving 
uh, Erdogan moving Turkey sort of away from Europe and the US back towards the Muslim world. And you have Saudi, for example, moving it away from the Muslim world more towards these other new alliances. And that's as a result of the identity, what the nation chooses its identity to be. Is it one that is Ummah centric or is it one that is specifically economic centric? Just let's make money. Kashmir doesn't matter. Palestine doesn't matter. What matters is that we can all have nice parties in Jeddah or the like. This identity is fundamentally important because based on the identity you choose, it has the potential to transform the entire region. And that's why Imran Khan was able to evoke so much resonance in the Muslim world in such a short period of time that created this hope in the Muslim world, even amongst those who had never been interested in Pakistan before. But that's something we can go into later on. We will talk more about this identity which was being created by Imran Khan, Mahathir, Muhammad and Erdogan. We will definitely going to talk about that. But before that, a very uh, genuine question arises in one's mind uh, that, uh, like uh, you talk about uh, uh, Mohammed bin Salman trying to, you know, uh, entice and try to woo the Israelis. Fine, that is the thing, and he's going towards he's going to his moderation in uh, KSA. Fine, but uh, once you look at Erdogan for uh, his once he got politically weakened quite recently. He met uh, the Israelis. He went. Uh, he goes and meets uh, uh, the, the Israeli Prime Minister. He is also banking upon them. So how could uh, how 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 can the Turkish attitude is different from the Saudi attitude? This is a question that's often asked: Why is it halal for Erdogan and haram for for Mohammed bin Salman? I think that the reality is that it is deeply disappointing and heartbreaking to see Erdogan sit with Netanyahu. There's no doubt about that. It is a disgrace and a very difficult thing to swallow to watch Turkey really pursue Israel. And it's even more heartbreaking when you consider that the only reason Erdogan is doing it is because he's worried about the Turkish electorate who are angry about the economy. So Erdogan says, let me make peace with Israel so I can get economic benefit from the US so that the Turkish can be in an economically better situation at the expense of the Palestinians. And then they will vote for me and then I will be able to stay in power. I think that is a tragedy and that is definitely tragic. I think uh, having said that, I think the reason, and I will word this carefully, I think the reason people make excuses for Erdogan in a way that they don't make excuses for bin Salman is because of the perception regarding what is driving these talks. Erdogan, when he goes to Israel, you mentioned it as well in your question, and everybody is saying it as well. When Erdogan is weak, he is chasing out Israel. When he's strong, Netanyahu says he calls me Hitler. The point being is that when Erdogan is strong, ideally, he doesn't want to be aligned with Israel. When he's weak, he decides that he wants to get closer to Israel, suggesting that Erdogan's convictions lie much closer with Palestine and that if he was strong, this, the presumption is he would do more for Palestine. And the reality is Erdogan remains quite popular amongst the Palestinians because at least the Palestinians believe that Erdogan is sincere in his love for Palestine, even if he's a bit pragmatic in terms uh, of what he does. And that's reflected in the way that, for example, Mahmoud Abbas, the head of the Palestinian Authority, is unpopular amongst the Palestinians and went to Turkey to try to become more popular and try to draw on legitimacy from Erdogan. If you, if you contrast that with Saudi Arabia, with Mohammed bin Salman, the reality is that the perception of the reasons why bin Salman is normalizing with Israel is not because bin Salman is weak. It's not because bin Salman lacks money. It's not because bin Salman needs the Israelis. It is about bin Salman presenting a new vision of the Middle East in which he believes that these Muslim issues no longer matter anymore. That Palestine is a thing of the past. Make peace with Israel and let's move on. Let's make peace with India and sort out Kashmir and let's just move on. The, the stolen land doesn't matter. The stolen 
Uh, so it doesn't matter. What matters is my vision 2030 because the new Saudi Arabia is not a Saudi Arabia that is connected with the Islamic identity. It's a Saudi Arabia of the modern age. It's raves. It's Iggy Azalea coming and twerking in, in Jeddah. It is the youth having parties. It is less uh, hijab. It is alcohol now. It is about coming to the modern age rather than being stuck in this backward trend that this Saudi Arabia has been stuck in as a result of certain ideologies. And this is why Bin Salman's outreach to Israel, where Erdogan's outreach is out of weakness and, and a perception that Erdogan would like it to be otherwise, but he's stuck. With Bin Salman, it's, I have a new vision and I'm going to show it to the Middle East. Israel, come, let's sit down. I have no problem with you whatsoever. And that's reflected even in the UAE sentiment. So if you, if you watch the UAE ambassador to Washington, when he talks about normalization with Israel, he doesn't talk about it from the perspective of the Palestinians. He says, we are people of peace and we are fighting against theocratic regimes like Iran. We are fighting against theocratic ideologies. And he once described it as capitalism versus communism. We are the ones seeking to bring a new age of peace. And they are the ones still stuck in this Islamic history where they want to keep highlighting these causes such as Palestine and Kashmir. So the point going back to your question is, it's not that people believe what Erdogan is doing is correct. It is that the perception of the reasons behind the ties is very different. And I will say this, consider that in Turkey, and I know it sounds like I'm defending Erdogan, but in reality, I feel a bit sick trying uh, in that I, it's not that I'm defending his ties with Israel. It's to put things into context in order to understand. When, for example, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam signed the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, Umar ibn al-Khattab anhu openly and publicly said, Ya Rasulullah, why are we signing this treaty? Alasna ala al-haq, are we not the ones on the truth? So the idea of being angry at Erdogan signing with Israel is legitimate. I'm not saying this is a treaty of Hudaybiyah. I'm saying that sometimes treaties can look bad. But the point here is this. In Turkey, consider that when the Ottoman Caliphate fell, Ataturk emerges or the young Turks emerge, they divorce uh, Turkey from Islam, they imprison the scholars, they change the language, they brutalize the Kurdish population, they essentially uh, change the Adhan from Arabic to Turkish, they imprison anybody who tries to restore Islam. The Quran printing is banned in the 1940s, 1950s. But there is this Muslim movement in Turkey that has been pushing back against Ataturk that resulted in Adnan Menderes and then Erbakan in the 1990s. Erdogan is the result of that. In other words, you can see in Turkey, there's a battle between Erdogan and between Ataturk's ideology, a, a, a battle between the Hagia Sophia and between Ataturk's ideology. And Erdogan is struggling in this battle. You can see that in Saudi Arabia, it's the opposite. You have Islam, which is prevalent and bin Salman introducing reforms to try to restrict and constrain the role of Islam in society by imprisoning uh, scholars, by imposing new restrictions on loudspeakers for Adhan or the like. The point being is that Erdogan, the reason people make excuses is because he's still seen as part of a 90 year battle against Ataturk's legacy in which a lot of victories have been made while bin Salman is being seen as reversing the Islamic influences in Saudi Arabia. And that's why to finish on this point, when Erdogan goes to Israel, the perception is, and I, I emphasize on perception, I do think there's a lot of ugly pragmatism to it, but the perception is Erdogan is doing it out of weakness and the Israelis know it, whereas bin Salman is doing it because he believes there should be a new vision and the Palestinians who are in Saudi, in Sa Saudis, they say this, the Palestinians who have been ungrateful to Saudi Arabia for all the money they gave them and support they gave them, just let Israel have their lands and let's move on and, and, and the world moves on. Sami, thank you for this very elaborate answer. I understand where you're coming from, and I agree with you as well on most of the what you've said. It's uh, more to do with ugly pragmatism, as you said. But a tough question arises. So before we move forward, let's address this tough question. The tough question is that uh, Saudis, uh, the, liberal, the liberalization of uh, Saudi Arabia, the kingdom of Saudi Arabia by Mohammed bin Salman, the argument over there is that they say that listen you've got uh, you talk about turkey our people go to istanbul to have fun the world goes to istanbul to have fun and to party and to for tourism all right 
Our people go to, they used to go to Beirut, uh, now the, the Lebanon. Now they go to Dubai, UAE. All these places are liberal. That's why they've got uh, the economy, but their economy is flourishing. Our people are going. And basically that is what our people want. They want this kind of entertainment. That's why uh, we are providing them entertainment at home. So why can't we be modern, so-called modern? Uh, why can't we strike that balance? That is their argument. What do you have to say to that? Well, how come there is a ban? And there, I, I've got my own opinion to that. I think because Saudi Arabia claims to be the uh, uh, torchbearer of the Muslim Ummah, and that because you've got Mecca over there and you've got Medina there, and they, they have to they have to maintain their conservative and tradition uh, traditional outlook uh, because of which they are earning again loads and loads lot because of people they travel over there for uh umrah and hajj or, or as the westerners would call it religious tourism they've got that but they want more they want uh Mohammed bin salman's vision 2030 because oil would end at the one particular day and they want to expand i mean that's what their argument is that they want to diversify their economy so why can't they do that I think that's a very good question. I, th I think the first thing that is worth noting is that there is often an assertion that this is what the people want. But I think that if we look at it from an empirical perspective, there is no evidence to suggest that this is what the people want, or even that this is. Th there's no evidence to suggest that the people have been shouting at Al Saud and telling them, please bring us alcohol to Saudi Arabia and bring us the raves, and we want to see Iggy Azalea twerking on the stage. The reason why I say that is because when you look at the Middle East, the reality is that after colonization, after after independence, the period went through what I call semi-colonization, which is that the economies were dependent, still dependent on like France and, and some of these other places, which meant that uh, freedoms were often chained and contained by these authoritarian regimes that many of these Western states uh, initially didn't prefer, but managed to find a working relationship with. The reason why I say that is that the first indication of a popular sentiment of where the people would like the country to go was in the Arab Spring. And that's why there was a fierce reaction to it. The Arab Spring was the first time we saw free and fair elections in the Arab world. And in those free and fair elections, after 60 years of secularism in Tunisia, secularism to the extent that Bourguiba, who had won independence for Tunisia, went on TV once during Ramadan in the 60s and during the day he had an orange juice and he drank in front of the camera on the TV in the day to tell people that you should not fast during Ramadan because our economy is not doing well and Ramadan will affect your productivity. Therefore, I give you a fatwa, don't fast Ramadan so we can keep the economy going. When you have this kind of secularism, the introduction of alcohol, when you have the introduction of the parties and the like, government sponsored, we're not talking private sector here on private land, we're talking government sponsored in Tunisia. When you have, for example, Jamal Abdel Nasser in Egypt, when he stands up and he says, they are telling me to push women to wear the hijab, you know, and, and he laughs at the idea about wearing the hijab. And we see the liberalization of Egypt in the 70s and 80s. Despite 60 or 50 years of government sponsored secularization, when the first free and fair elections take place in the post Arab Spring, the parties that claim to promise to bring back an Islamic kind of rule. I'm not talking Khilaf, I'm talking the, the parties that promise to put Islam at the center of but policy like are the I ones that won, one. but not just one, they dominated. Uh, a Muslim Brotherhood came first, then it would be Hizb al Salafi, for example, in Egypt, they would come second or third. Ali al Shabi in Tunisia, another party associated with Islamic identity, came third in Tunisia. The point being that when the people freely chose the people quite resoundingly said that despite 50 years of this government telling us this is what the people want, we want a party that puts Islam at the center of what policy is made. The only indication, empirical indication we have of what the people want in the Muslim world is the first free and fair elections in the Arab Spring. And that's why, Adil, if you read the New York Times article, the dark prince of the Middle East, they're talking about Mohammed bin Zayed, and they talk to officials about the interactions between the UAE and the US. In this article, which anybody can find on Google, Bin Zayed says to the Americans 
that if you allow free and fair elections in the Muslim world, if you support these democratic transitions, these people will vote for people who believe the Quran should be the constitution. If he, Bin Zayed tells the Americans in this article, Bin Zayed, the UAE president, tells the Americans to tell them to stop supporting democratic transitions. He said, if a man would stand up in Mecca today and say, I am the Mahdi to deliver the, the Islam, 80% of the UAE army would go and join this man in Mecca. This identity of the Muslim, the Muslim world is very strong and the people will vote for it. So be careful what you wish for. Don't support these democratic transitions. So when people say that these reforms in Saudi Arabia are popular, the only empirical evidence suggests that that's not the case. Not only that, Adel, let's go one step further. If it was popular, there would be no need to imprison the scholars because the people would not react to the scholars. There would be no need to sack imams for giving a khutbah against it because the khutbah would have no influence on a people who want to see Iggy Azalea come and twerk in Riyadh, for example, and celebrate. And she's been invited again by, by, by Saudi Arabia. People tend to say this, let the people be free, let them do what they want. But the reality is these are being imposed on a people who, if they were left to choose, I argue they would not choose it. And I think this is why I think that when it comes to Saudi Arabia, yes, I understand that Vision 2030 is being presented as a liberalization. And I also understand that many people have had issues with the interpretation of Islam in Saudi Arabia. Across the Muslim world, we always hear it all the time, that it is very strict, their interpretation is strict, that whatever. Okay, but that's a debate that should be had within the Islamic framework. It's not about, for example, taking a woman in niqab and abaya and then stripping her into a bikini. It's about suddenly, it's about trying to shift the where we talk within the framework of Islam. And I think what we're seeing in Vision 2030 is not that. What we're seeing in Vision 2030 is the divorce of Islam from the Saudi identity. And I'll finish on this point. If you notice that bin Salman has introduced what's called a founding day, the, 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 the commemoration of the founding of the kingdom. And bin Salman, in an unprecedented move, changed the, he ordered the royal historians to change the date. So for those who don't know, Saudi is often the royal historians or the historians are in a consensus that the Saudi kingdom began when Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab and Muhammad al Saud agreed on a pact in which they said to themselves, we are going to uh, establish a kingdom where the constitution is the Quran and the Sunnah is, is, is the constitution. La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. And they went and they fought the other tribes and they established it. Bin Salman has changed the date from 1744 when this pact was made to 1727 when Muhammad al Saud becomes the chief of the tribe. Essentially, Bin Salman is trying to remove Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab from the establishing of the kingdom, essentially trying to say that the establishment of the kingdom was not an Islamic endeavor. It was not about establishing La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. It's about Muhammad al Saud, a tribal chief who set out with his tribe to establish the kingdom. It's a nationalist pursuit. It's a tribal pursuit. And this is what established the Saudi kingdom. And if you look at the emblem, that bin Salman has chosen to celebrate the founding of the kingdom. Think about the Saudi flag. The Saudi flag says La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah on the flag, clearly indicating, as all Saudi princes have always asserted, that Saudi is built on the Quran and Sunnah, and Allah rewarded us with the kingdom because we upheld Quran and Sunnah. In the emblem bin Salman has chosen, he's chosen the symbol of the horse, the, the palm tree, the sword, and the majlis, or the market, the sug. And the flag in the middle has nothing written on it. So in the emblem, there's no reference to Islam at all as part of the founding of the kingdom. And also in the image that he uses of ad dirayya which is the historic capital of Saudi Arabia, which is like a small town, for example, or, or, or a small village on the outskirts of Riyadh. The, the picture that he's chosen has no minarets. The minarets have been erased from the picture. So the founding day is about divorcing Islam from that. So I think that the direct answer to your question is the empirical evidence suggests the opposite, that this is not what the people want and it's being forced on the people. And also the pursuit of what bin Salman is, is, is pursuing is being done by force, not by popular cohesion. It's done by imprisoning scholars, imprisoning opposition, not by getting the people to reject the scholars and rejecting the people and to support Muhammad bin Salman. So I think that 
we should be wary how we skew the narrative on Saudi. So what, you, what I take from your very detailed answer is that there is resistance to what Mohammed bin Salman is doing and that, that resistance is being jailed, incarcerated, just like there was resistance in Pakistan uh, to, towards undemocratic forces, and they are being jailed like Imran Khan. We'll come to that, just like Morsi was jailed in Egypt by the military, Western-backed military. Same is happening in Pakistan. We will come to that, definitely. I would like to discuss that with you. I'd like to pick up your brains about Morsi and uh, the, the, the similarities between Morsi's situation and Imran Khan situation, but before that, you I, I heard you talking about uh, this uh, Muslim Ummah, con- the new identity conference, uh, which was uh, which was an initiative by Malaysia, by Mahathir Mohammed and uh, Erdogan of Turkey and uh, Imran Khan of Pakistan. But at uh, the nick of uh, the hour, you know, at the, at the exact time, Imran Khan was forced not to attend by Mohammed bin Salman, and he was forced not to enter that identity. But Imran Khan did go to the stage at the United Nations and he said what he had to say and that resonated in the entire Muslim Ummah. But why do you think uh, the Arab kingdoms are so scared for a separate liberal or democratic identity for the Muslim Ummah, which was uh, which was being created actually by Mahathir, by Erdogan and Imran Khan? I think that what's important to note is that for UAE and Saudi Arabia in particular, and these are the two countries that really put pressure on Pakistan and really put pressure on Imran Khan, and these are the two countries that celebrated when Imran Khan was toppled. I think it's important to highlight that for them, the Arab Spring was an existential crisis. Suddenly the people were voting, suddenly the people were protesting against authoritarianism. There was this wave, it started in Tunisia. Tunisia was a small country, they said it won't have much impact. But then Egypt fell, the largest of the Arab countries, historically very important. And then Libya, for example, although Libya, NATO intervention, I always call it a semi-revolution because I think the NATO intervention was a bit... But the point is that there was this movement and the UAE and Saudi were terrified that this movement was going to spread. And the beneficiaries of that movement were Islamic movements. So it was movements that evoked a resonance amongst the population that the UAE and Saudi wanted to control. Their problem with Erdogan and Imran Khan was a simple one. Erdogan and Imran Khan, and Imran Khan in particular managed to do it in a much quicker pace than Erdogan did, was beginning to exert influence over the populations that the UAE and Saudi wanted to control. People often say, oh, but they don't speak Arabic, they don't speak whatever. The language is irrelevant. It's abundantly clear that the Muslim world resonates with Islamic rhetoric. And we see it in, in the way that they resonate with Turkey or they resonate with Imran Khan or they resonate with, 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 with others or the like. This existential crisis had to be crushed. And that's why the UAE and Saudi supported the coup in Egypt. They toppled Mohammed Morsi. They lobbied uh, Washington to recognize the coup. And then they supported Haftar the warlord in Libya. They are supporting the coup in Tunisia recently. They subverted the the revolution in, 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 in Yemen as well. The point here being there was this fierce resistance, but resistance against what? resistance not necessarily against the muslim brotherhood albeit the muslim brother made many mistakes and personally i'm not particularly fond of them but but the point is it was a resistance against the people deciding to choose who they want because the people had decided that they resonate with an islamic identity as opposed to a national identity and the reason that's important is because i go back to what i said about bin zayed when he said my army would join a man who calls to islam in mecca so my army would resonate with a man outside my borders if he calls to something that is Islamic. And that's what happened with Imran Khan. The idea being that Pakistan was always supposed to be a proxy of Saudi. Saudi invested money in Pakistan. Saudi helped build Pakistan's nuclear weapon. Saudi bails out Pakistan. Pakistan generals keep a close tie with Saudi Arabia. Saudi is the bank that Pakistan uses when Pakistan is struggling. Therefore, Pakistan must toe the line when it comes to Saudi Arabia. And Imran Khan, in many ways, sought to respect that in the way that he used to visit Mohammed bin Salman. The issue for Saudi Arabia, however, however, was that Imran Khan was the first Pakistani leader, perhaps in decades, that was suddenly raising people's heads in the areas of the Arab world, in the Muslim world. When he gave his speech in the UN, 
everybody went, where did this leader come from? This is one of the best speeches that we've heard in the defense of Islam. When France uh, defended the, car the cartoons insulting the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, before it would be Erdogan shouting on his own, a UAE statement that supports Macron, a soft Saudi statement that doesn't want to upset the French. But this time you had Erdogan shouting and Imran Khan coming out and pushing initiatives. We want to do a joint channel. We want to do an OIC meeting. We want to push these issues. And he spoke English as well, very eloquently as well, tapping into a Western Muslim population as well, who would then go on TV platforms and media platforms and speak in favor of the current trend as well. For the UAE in Saudi Arabia, Imran Khan was sitting face to face and saying, I'm your ally, and then going to Pakistan and suddenly the, 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 the center of influence was being shifted from those areas where Saudi and UAE could control it to an area where they could no longer control it. Pakistani's flag was being raised when Azerbaijan initially liberated the areas of Nagorno-Karabakh. For imagine you are Saudi, imagine you are the UAE, and you're sitting there and you see Nagorno-Karabakh, which many of us had never heard of beforehand. But I remember here in London, the imams in the mosques were giving khutbah on Nagorno-Karabakh, explaining to us what it is and why it is part of the Muslim conscience. When Saudi and the UAE see that the Muslim Ummah celebrating is raising Turkish flags and Pakistani flags under Imran Khan and Erdogan, of course it's going to cause a dilemma, it's going to cause an issue for Saudi Arabia and the UAE, especially at a time in which UAE was normalizing ties with Israel and at a time in which Saudi Arabia is improving its ties with India. I think that when Imran Khan came to power, there are many Pakistanis who get in touch with me sometimes and they say, yes, but Sami, the economy and yes, whatever. The reality is that economy had nothing to do with why Imran Khan fell out with the Arab states or even why Imran Khan was toppled. Imran Khan was toppled because in his rhetoric, in his leadership of Pakistan, it was no longer just Turkey leading the way on Muslim issues. Mahathir saw the opportunity to bring in Pakistan. He saw the opportunity to capitalize on it, which is why when the Kuala Lumpur summit was announced in 2019, Mahathir Muhammad openly said this is not a challenge to Saudi Arabia. But the reason he said that is because he knew that everybody saw it as a challenge to Saudi Arabia. He said it because he was aware that the Saudis were very angry with the idea that Turkey, Imran Khan and Mahathir, three of the most popular leaders in the Muslim world, were about to gather in Kuala Lumpur to essentially do a show of force that this is the new center of Muslim power, that the Muslim leaders are no longer in Riyadh, the Muslim leaders are in Islamabad, they are in Ankara, and they are in uh, Kuala Lumpur. And this for Saudi Arabia, for Mohammed bin Salman, who still believes that he needs to cloak his de-Islamization reforms in something that looks Islamic, i.e. to get some scholars to celebrate it, to try to make things feel as if they are within the Sunnah, this was for Imran, if they considered this a huge betrayal from Imran Khan, it was how dare Imran Khan be independent? How dare Imran Khan lead Pakistan to become a Muslim leader? How dare Imran Khan try to make Pakistan an equal of Saudi Arabia? How dare Imran Khan try to break this relationship of dependence on Saudi Arabia? How dare Imran Khan try to lead on issues in a way that makes us look bad? And the reality is this, Imran Khan, when he had the leadership of the OIC, look at all the OIC agenda. The primary topics were always Palestine, Kashmir, Palestine, Kashmir, Palestine, Kashmir. And to put it into context, some Pakistanis might be thinking and listening, okay, but this is all rhetoric, this is all talk. When Israel was bombarding Gaza, when Israel was bombarding Gaza, Al Arabiya, the Saudi-backed TV channel, its media coverage was blaming the Palestinians, not the Israelis. It was saying it's the Palestinians' fault that they are being bombarded. UAE media was supporting the Israelis against the Gazans. The Saudi statement did not refer to occupation. The Saudi called on the Israeli authorities, changing the way that... At that same time, you had Imran Khan very loudly in the OIC, Palestine, 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 Gaza, Palestine. The contrast was so vivid 
in the public conscience. Now think about Muhammad bin Salman who has to keep his population under control, knowing his population are against his reforms. They are resonating with Imran Khan. They are resonating with Erdogan. They are resonating with Mahad and Muhammad. As long as Imran Khan keeps talking about these issues, we have a problem because our people are going to start looking to them for leadership as opposed to us. And this is where Imran Khan caused a huge issue. Even with the UN on Islamophobia, when he gave his speech, his speech on Islamophobia, which in my opinion is one of the greatest speeches given in the UN in defense of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa His speech in the UN came about at a time in which Anwar Gargash of the UAE, the advisor to Muhammad bin Zayed, was openly saying that Macron has every right to crack down on the Muslims, to impose draconian laws, to restrict mosques and force them into a charter because Macron has legitimate security concerns. Put yourself, Adil, in the position of the UAE and Saudi Arabia. The Arab Spring showed that the people resonate with Islam, that they resonate with Islamic leadership, that they resonate with those who talk in an Islamic language. Then Erdogan appears, but Erdogan speaks Turkish. Okay, they resonate with Erdogan, but Erdogan has influence, but it's limited by the language barrier. Then Imran Khan comes, who speaks fluent English in an eloquent way, who talks in a more dignified manner than perhaps than Erdogan did. For the UAE and Saudi, Pakistan cannot be allowed to be led by Imran Khan. Something has to change. And that is why I think that Imran Khan, in such a short space of time, alienated them. And I'll finish on this point. What's very interesting is this. Those who like to criticize Imran Khan for alienating Saudi Arabia and the UAE, Forget a particular point. The Saudis, when they view Pakistan, they view Pakistan as a proxy, but the level of disrespect is clear in the way in which they approach India. For Pakistan, Pakistan is not important enough anymore for Saudi Arabia that it should ignore India. For bin Salman and Saudi Arabia, India now is of more value than Pakistan. And that's why Kashmir is not of particular importance. Yes, Saudi Arabia refused to go to the tourism summit in Kashmir that India tried to hold under the auspices of the G20. But that's because bin Salman was wary of the Muslim backlash. He's wor worried about the Muslim backlash. But the reality is that for Saudi Arabia, India is becoming more important because from the Saudi perspective, there's nothing Pakistan can do about it. You are cash trapped. You need our money. And the reason why I mentioned this point is because their mobilization against Imran Khan and their blessing for those who came after Imran Khan suggests that for Saudi, Pakistan was a threat or was becoming a prominent power under Imran Khan, but is going back to dependency and going back to a weaker relationship under this new leadership that has come about in Pakistan. So when Pakistanis say, oh, but Imran Khan was poor in foreign policy, no. The reaction to Imran Khan was because Pakistan, for the first time, in my lifetime at least, for the first time, Pakistan was sitting on the same table of influence as Turkey, as Mahathir and the others. And Saudi Arabia, when Imran Khan left, celebrated that Pakistan went whoom, back down into that relationship. need to be aware of this when they are look at Imran Khan. But to summarize on, on this sentence, to summarize, Imran Khan's resonance on a people that the Saudis and UAE wanted to control is the reason why they detested Imran Khan. And the lack of resonance of Pakistan now under this current leadership over these populations is why Saudi and the UAE are celebrating. They celebrate a weak Pakistan because they were terrified of a strong one. That was that was really mind blowing answer. Let me tell you, and I really respect you for speaking your heart out, sitting here in the UK. Uh, but my second last last question, a quick one and a quick brief answer. Do you compare? Is there a comparison between uh, Morsi and Imran Khan? And if there is, what is the comparison? I think the comparison between Morsi and Imran Khan is a terrifying one, and I'll, and 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 I'll and, and I'll explain why. When Imran Khan was toppled in the vote of no confidence, when the Supreme Court convened at midnight to debate the issue of the no motion, no confidence or unprecedented, the, the scramble to remove Imran Khan meant that they managed to get the Supreme Court to sit at midnight to debate the no motion, uh, the, the no the vote of no confidence motion. When Imran Khan was toppled, I think the reason it took so long to arrest Imran Khan. The reason it was so difficult to get Imran Khan into handcuffs was because the Pakistanis took to the streets in their thousands. 
I think when the Pakistanis took just in Islamabad, but in Lahore and Karachi and these other places as well, the reality is that the establishment, they felt fear. They said that this could turn into something that is serious. This is potentially the greatest challenge that we are facing politically because the people are now in the streets. The reason why I mentioned that is because when the establishment felt that the people were no longer taking to the streets in their thousands like they were before. When the events of May 9th, of 9th of May, that the, 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 the establishment then gaslighted the population. Oh, look, they are burning the barracks. Look, they are burning property. Look what they are doing. When they gaslighted the population and suddenly tried to strike fear in the Pakistani people, when enough Pakistanis started going back to their homes, that's when they mobilized to go and arrest Imran Khan. That's when they got the paramilitaries to arrest Imran Khan because the establishment believes that as time passes, people will start to get tired of the Imran Khan cause. They'll get they're sick and tired of hearing his name over and over again. There'll be fatigue and people will just move on. The reason why I, I, I mention this is because the Morsi comparison is terrifying because when Sisi originally toppled Morsi, there were huge protests that took place in Egypt. But when these protests started to dwindle, Sisi then went in to crush the protesters. Once that popular mobilization on the street finished, there was no pressure on Sisi to even put Morsi before the courts. He left Morsi in prison and Morsi died in prison. The reality is that when you strike the comparison with Morsi and Imran Khan, Imran Khan in prison now, people often say that, or, or those who are apathetic, those who are neutral between quotation marks, they often say, I don't like the way people celebrate Imran Khan as a hero. But I think that misses the point. The point here is not about Imran Khan himself, even though he's an important factor. The point is what Imran Khan represents. He is in prison today for the, the only reason he is in prison today is because the establishment believe he will win a majority in the election. The only reason he is in prison today, the only reason, the only reason why he had to be arrested and why they didn't leave him alone to go home or allowed him to leave the country, the only reason he's arrested is because if Imran Khan runs in the elections, the Pakistani people will vote for him and they will deliver him to power. Therefore, Imran Khan being in prison, for the neutrals, it should not be about Imran Khan. It's about the establishment saying that if the people are going to choose somebody that we don't want, Wallahi la ilaha illahu, over my dead body, I'll allow the Pakistanis to choose who they want. I will put him in prison. I will throw 200 plus charges. I will mobilize the Supreme Court at midnight. I will bring case after case after case after case it's from something as simple as a tweet to something as major as corruption. I will bring every case to make sure that he cannot run in elections because I don't want you, the Pakistani, to vote for him because I, the establishment, am enjoying ruling Pakistan and I will not tolerate the Pakistani people telling me that I am not allowed to rule this country. That's what Imran Khan represents. And this is where the terrifying concept comes from. If Imran Khan is allowed to stay in prison, if the Pakistani people abandon Imran Khan and leave him in prison, they are not abandoning Imran Khan. They are abandoning the battle to decide who Pakistan is supposed to serve. If Imran Khan stays in prison, and la qadar Allah, may Allah forbid, if Imran Khan dies in prison, then what dies with him is this potential for revolution to finally take back Pakistan from a minority who have seized it for themselves and have imposed themselves on Pakistan. The reality is that there are many people who say, but there should be stability in Pakistan. I ask every Pakistani, you've had independence since the 50s and 60s, since Muhammad Ali Jinnah. Has your economy become great? Have you become a major power? Have you become politically relevant? Have you become even India now? You are struggling to find even allies against India. So this establishment that has ruled, have they delivered the Pakistan that today you can say is something that is worth backing and worth defending under the leadership of the establishment? The answer is a resounding no. Pakistanis, they leave Pakistan and the like because they don't like the way that it's being ruled. This is why I reiterate the point for Imran Khan and even for the Muslim world. The reason the Muslim world is watching what's happening in Pakistan 
Pakistan. The reason the Muslim world is watching what's happening in Imran Khan is not just because of Imran Khan himself. It's because the Muslim world has seen in the Pakistani people a sudden desire for freedom. When they saw the thousands of Pakistanis in the streets, they saw the challenge that the Muslims want to present to their own regimes. And they are watching the Pakistanis and saying, does freedom win? Can a people topple an authoritarian regime? Can they topple an establishment? This is what I mean by Imran Khan made Pakistan a leader. He made Pakistan a leader with his rhetoric. And when he was toppled, he made Pakistan a leader in the way that people are watching Pakistan and silently hoping that the people win against the establishment. But my warning is this, going back to your question, I'll finish on this point. When you mentioned Mursi and, and Imran Khan, the warning is this, that if the people lose, it become tired, if they have fatigue, the establishment is gambling, that the longer they keep Imran Khan in prison and the longer there is a stalemate, the people will go home. Once the people go home, once they get tired, once they sit in their rooms and they no longer care, the establishment will say, they won't say Alhamdulillah, but they will say, this is our moment. Let's now put the person that we want to be prime minister and the Pakistanis who scared us once upon a time have now gone back into their homes. This is why I argue, and, and I finish on this point, this is why I argue. Pakistan now is in a battle to renegotiate the social construct, to so the social contract. Who does Pakistan belong to? Who is Pakistan supposed to serve? Who decides who rules Pakistan? And what I'm worried about personally, and you brought the Mursi example, what I'm worried about personally is, Currently, the balance in favor is in favor of the establishment. After a few months ago, it looked like it was in favor of the people. And it's not that I'm calling for chaos, but I think that there should be an organized concerted movement because the only thing that will make the establishment back down is popular pressure. Is pop and that's why it's about keeping that pressure on, trying to organize how to keep that pressure. It's a difficult battle, yes, but that's because the prize is Pakistan, the prize is leadership, and the prize is the potential to be an influential power that Imran Khan suggested Pakistan could be in the short period that he ruled. Thank you so very much, um, Sami Hamdi. Final question, the, the small autocratic group of uh, ruling Pakistan, which we call as establishment, it's basically these are generals, uh, a select group of generals, very few generals, who are ruling Pakistan and the head of that establishment is the chief of the army staff. Now, this is the same establishment of the same military junta, which uh, were being called by the people of Palestine, by the people of Kashmir. They were being requested in number, in huge numbers, to come and save them. And by using the name of the people of Palestine, this uh, military junta, or the establishment as you call it, they have gained b billions of funds from the Muslim world. They, they took billions of funds. There have been sanctions in Pakistan as a response to the uh, nuclear blast. And uh, Pakistan was able to survive because they said that, listen, we are the only nuclear power of the Muslim Ummah. And we are going to uh, liberate uh, Palestine. And we are going to liberate Kashmir. And even then, today, today they talk about these things, but uh, they only talk about it. They don't, uh, they, they don't really, you know, uh, practice it. And they are going on the what you have said about uh, the philosophy in the, uh, in the Saudi Arabia, maybe, is to brush Palestine and Kashmir both under the carpet and wash their hands off it. So what do you think how the Pakistani military hunter uh, right now uh, and the Pakistani military as a whole, which you call establishment, is viewed in the Muslim world right now. What are what are the genuine feelings of the people in Palestine and people of Kashmir and generally all over the Muslim Ummah about the Pakistani military? That is what I wanted to ask. I'm interested to know as a third generation Pakistan army officer. I think that one of the things that is worth noting is that the perception of Pakistan before Imran Khan was not a particularly prevalent one. The reality is that Pakistan was not a major influential power in the consciousness at least of the Arab world and the like. Pakistan was only often talked about in terms of its contributions in the wars to try to liberate Palestine. It was considered a Muslim brother, a brother, but there wasn't much detail or information about what's happening inside Pakistan because there wasn't much interest either, nor did Pakistan really try to position itself as a leader in, in the Muslim world. It was always seen as sort of a, a second tier. That of course changed with Imran Khan in which 
there was a lot of spotlight on Pakistan. A lot of people suddenly trying to understand Pakistan, what it is, how it came to be, and, and learning its history or the like. The reality is that the military in Pakistan today is seen in the same light as the Egyptian army, an army that believes that it has the sole right to rule the country, an army that believes that it has a divine right to rule the country, an army that believes that a civilian has no right to tell the army what to do. And the reason why I mentioned this point is because I think that one of the reasons Imran Khan was toppled was because he tried to exercise the democratic mandate against the establishment. When he was giving recommendations as to who should be the intelligence chief, who should be the next army chief of staff, the establishment sort of looked at each other and went, how dare a civilian come to us and try to tell us who should be appointed and who shouldn't be appointed. And they considered it a bid'ah. Even though in Islamic history, if you consider that the sword of Allah, Khalid ibn Walid, radiallahu anhu, who took the Muslim armies to Iraq, who took the Muslim armies to Syria, who never lost a battle, while Umar ibn Khattab, radiallahu anhu, was sitting in Medina, he would sit in Medina and the armies would go out and fight. So people often say, but the army put their lives on the line. Umar ibn Khattab used to sit in Medina, radiallahu anhu, al Farooq, one of the greatest men in history, one of the greatest companions, would sit in Medina while Khalid ibn Walid would go to the battlefield. When Umar ibn Khattab went to remove Khalid ibn Walid, when he brought Khalid ibn Walid to the, to the masjid and Khalid ibn Walid's hands were tied because he was accused of transgressing in his powers, when Umar ibn Khattab ordered that Khalid ibn Walid be dismissed from his post, even though people said, how can Umar remove the sword of Allah? Well, Khalid ibn Walid did not organize a vote of no confidence. He did not get Bilal ibn Rabah and Abdullah ibn Mas'ud and the other Sahaba together at midnight in a Supreme Court meeting to get rid of Umar ibn Khattab by Shura. He did not try to launch a coup with Abu Ubaid al Jarrah and these other generals who were too embarrassed to go and look at Khalid ibn Walid after he had been dismissed. Khalid ibn Walid went back to his home and he died three, four years later. He accepted the rule of Umar al-Khattab because the legitimacy of the elected ruler by Shura is superior to the legitimacy of the commander in chief. That was the relationship between Umar al-Khattab and between Khalid ibn Walid. The man appointed by consensus by the people, Umar al-Khattab is superior even though Khalid is the one who went and fought in the battlefield in Iraq and in Syria. And people say that Khalid was upset. Yes, Khalid was upset. But when he died, he left his estate to Umar ibn Khattab because he still loved and respected Umar ibn Khattab. I'm not saying Imran Khan is Umar ibn Khattab and I'm not saying that Bajwa is Khalid ibn Walid. I'm saying look how men who are better than both of them and look at the relationship. The civilian ruler is superior to the commander in chief or the chief of staff because the popular legitimacy is more high in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala based on shura than the legitimacy of the gun. So what the army in Pakistan and in Egypt consider a bid'ah is considered the, the way it should be based on the Quran, based on Islamic. Imran Khan was elected. He is the superior authority over the army chief of staff. And that's what the Pakistani army refused to accept. That's what the Pakistani army and the Egyptian army refused to accept. When you ask me how people view the Pakistani army, they view it in this context. A Pakistani army like the Egyptian army, which believes it has a divine right to rule, which doesn't produce prosperity for Pakistan, which doesn't produce political but they are, but they are still, still holding on to power. They are still holding on to it because they have the gun and they will do what they need to do in order to stay in power. And that's a tragedy because I think the reality is that, and I'll finish on this point. Let's go back to what I said in the beginning where Muhammad bin Zayed says that if a man stood up and said, I'm going to make Islam victorious, he said 80% of my army would join them. When I When you look at them, if... It shows you that the Muslim world, if a leader stands up and says, guys, I am defending the Islamic issues, it shows you the whole Muslim world will stand behind him. That's what terrified Saudi and UAE over Imran Khan, that people like me, for example, born and raised in the West, who speak Arabic, who don't speak Urdu, was suddenly putting Imran Khan on the TV, listening, thinking, subhanAllah, the guy, mashallah, we say in Arabic, he said what my heart would love to say.
That's what terrified them, that Imran Khan's influence was not amongst the Pakistani borders, it was beyond. Because Imran Khan's identity was not Pakistani first, it was Muslim first. And, he, and if Imran Khan had been left in power, I think that the same way you see Western Muslims leave Western countries to go to Turkey because they believe in Erdogan's message, you would have seen them, Americans, English, French, all going to Pakistan because they would have believed in the same vision that Imran Khan. And that's why I wonder when it comes to the Pakistani people generally, I do wonder. You saw the influence Pakistan was starting to have under Imran Khan. How do you tolerate going back to a dependent relationship with the people who wanted you to always be second class. And that's why I think that one of the greatest tragedies when I watch my Pakistani brothers, and one of the reasons I, I, I try sometimes to be a bit loud about what's happening is to say to Pakistanis, Wallahi, as a Muslim, you could sense it. When Erdogan, Imran Khan and Mahara, that trio started to emerge, they were talking about a joint railway from Pakistan to Turkey. They were talking about a joint channel to talk to the world about Islam. They were talking about joint business de deals. They were talking about joint military agreements because suddenly three major Muslim powers had three very influential leaders, all with the same vision, with the same Muslim identity. And that's why Azerbaijan, which is traditionally secular, Azerbaijan waved the Pakistani flag because Imran Khan's identity that he preached was more powerful than the secular nationalist identity that the Azerbaijani government is trying to promote in Azerbaijan. And they resonated with it so much that they discarded that nationalist identity and they said to Imran Khan, Wallahi, the Pakistanis, we consider ourselves as one brotherhood with them as well. I think the Pakistanis should be aware, and I finish with this sentence, they are in the battle of a lifetime. It's a crossroads. People sometimes think I exaggerate. It's not an exaggeration. If Imran Khan is not allowed to run in the elections, the establishment will have won not over Imran Khan, over the Pakistani people. The establishment will have said to the Pakistani people, how dare you try to tell me who should rule Pakistan? I decide who rules you, and your job is to say, Sam'an wa ta'a, I accept. And I don't think that Pakistanis, with dignity, should ever tolerate or accept that. Thank you so very much. Jazakallah khaira, Sami Hamdi, for this very candid talk. We hope and uh, we would like you to come again and uh, discuss uh, certain important issues with us. Once again, Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum. Ladies and gentlemen, we would uh, uh, beg leave for now. I mean, uh, this, is, uh, this discussion, I think, was uh, the burden of truth of this discussion is going to take you time to handle it and to digest it and i think you need to digest it because this is the need of the hour see you soon fear man allah